It's a pleasure to introduce Faraz Abuzaid, who's um, going to be giving us a presentation that he's going to give at VLDB in um, a couple weeks. Um, he'd like to present this under conference conditions, so he wants to lecture straight through with no interruptions for questions, and then we can do as much Q&A afterwards as your heart desires. Um, so, so it's only fifteen minutes. It's only so fifteen. No, you can ask as many questions. Fifteen as you want. minutes. I I advised him to not rush it, so that um, um, just to see what the the timing is like under under a um, normal normal speech speed. We'll see how it goes. Um, anyway, let me turn it over to Faraz. Thanks, Phil. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, so as Phil mentioned, my name is Faraz. I'm a fifth-year PhD student at Stanford, working with Peter Bayless and Mateza Zaharia. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a project uh, called DIFF, which is a relational interface that we proposed for large-scale data explanation. Before I jump in, I just wanted to thank all of the collaborators that we worked with on this project, not only the folks I worked with at Stanford, but also folks from Microsoft, from Facebook, and at Google. Without them, this project definitely wouldn't have been possible. Um, so the high-level focus of our work is trying to explain trends in high-volume data, which is a fundamental challenge for a lot of data analysts today. So to illustrate why this is so challenging, let's think of an example. Let's say that you're trying to track a mobile app's user engagement, and you're some product manager, and you're trying to figure out why the number of daily active users for your app is declined in the last week. Okay? Now, if you're this PM, you pretty much have to do the following. You have to go through and inspect thousands of possible causes in your data. You're looking at the metrics of the different users across your app, and there's all sorts of possible factors, right? There's user demographic data, there's device and location metadata, there's probably temporal, some seasonal factors, depending on what the app is, and there's probably usually some combinations of factors that are at play here, right? Possibly temporal and user demographic data is shaping something in the data, right? This becomes a really tedious and arduous task for the product manager, right? If you're using your standard OLAP or BI tools, um, what you basically have to end up doing is you manually search through all these possible combos, right? You write a series of group by or cube queries. Um, you're, slicing your you're slicing and dicing your data repeatedly until you hit that magic sweet spot or you find that needle in the haystack, right? So people have proposed what are called explanation engines. That's the term that I'm going to use in this talk. They've proposed explanation engines that try to automate this search process, right? And this has been an active area of research for the last five years or so in the database community. So for example, um, out of our group at Stanford, we proposed the macro-based system at Sigmod 2017. But there's also been Scorpion at VLDB 2013. There's been Data X-Ray at uh, Sigmod 2015. And um, some work from UW, from Roy and Suchu at Sigmod 2014, right? And more or less what these explanation engines uh, aim to do is they're trying to identify particular features that are statistically significant in moving some particular metric that you, as an analyst, care about. So for example, if you're trying to track the, the DAU of that particular app, your explanation engine might identify that, oh, okay, it's device make Apple and this particular OS version and this particular app version that's giving you a 2x you know, decrease in the DAU, right? What these explanation engines uh, typically offer is pretty powerful, but they're sort of lacking two core um, missing pieces. Right? The first is interoperability. Right? If you're a data analyst, um, having an explanation is really handy, but chances are it's going to exist as some part of larger workflow. Right? You're doing some ETL, and then you're doing a traditional OLAP query. You might be doing a visualization. And then you also want to find the explanation. Right? It's very rare that you are doing this sort of explanation finding in a silo. Um, but the problem is that these explanation engines are usually standalone tools. And so the interoperability piece is actually pretty hard to navigate. The second issue is scalability, right? Most of these analysts these days are trying to figure out these explanations in an interactive setting, right? Because you're usually using this to do some sort of monitoring, for example. And if your data set is changing at a very high volume, a very fast pace, you don't have the time to analyze this overnight. You need to know within seconds or within minutes. Um, and so if you can't scale to that volume of data, then your explanation engine, for all of its power, isn't actually useful. So in today's talk, I want to talk about our proposal that sort of tackles both of these problems simultaneously, and that's the diff operator. So the diff operator is a declarative relational operator, right? And we decided to make this a declarative relational operator so that we can unify the core functionality of these different explanation engines and also address the interoperability challenges that I talked about on the previous slide, right? 
So if you have a relational operator, now it can integrate with all of your standard OLAP queries, all of your typical BI tools. It can, it can integrate with ETL, with pretty much any type of data cleaning or data analysis pipeline that you already have existing. Right? You can also take existing engines like Macrobase or Data X-Ray or Quick Insights or Scorpion and integrate uh, or rewrite those queries using our same interface. Right? That's kind of the, the ideal situation. Right? One, un one interface to rule them all, essentially. And the nice thing is that once you propose this relational operator, you can actually start to play the same sort of game that we in the database community love to do. We have a relational interface. Now we're going to apply query optimization on it. Right? And so in this work, we actually propose new logical and physical optimizations for this operator that actually make it scalable. And to show that this actually works, we have a scalable implementation of diff that we've open sourced online. Um, we integrated diff as an extension to the original Macrobase code base, so we call it Macrobase SQL. And we also have actually uh, a single node and distributed implementation in Spark, so that we can really test the scalability of this. Okay. So to show you how this works, I want to walk you guys through an example workflow using diff, right? Let's say we're going to use a slightly different example. We're not going to look at daily active users. We're going to look at crash logs, right? So here's my sample table of crash logs. Um, I've got three columns that sort of encode different categorical features. And I've also got a time step, and I've got the actual crash, whether it's true or false, right? So pay attention to the app version, device type, and OS columns, OK? So let's analyze these crash logs using diff. What I want to do is I want to figure out why is my app crashing? What's, what's driving the, the increase in crashes over the last couple of weeks, or really the last week? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select from star, and I'm going to take out the subset of tuples that um, have crashes. And I'm going to diff that with the remaining tuples where the crashes didn't occur. Right? So I'm going to use my diff operator to compare crash logs versus success logs. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically use diff. What diff tries to do is it does a group by, effectively, on the different possible combinations of dimensions that I care about. So here, I'm going to look at app version, device type, and OS. So it's going to do a group by, a count group by, on all single columns, so just app version, just device type, just OS, all pairs, and all triples in this case. We're just going to limit to triples for the sake of this presentation. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the counts in the two different tables. So I'm doing a group by on the crash logs. I'm doing a group by on the success logs. right? And I've got my counts per attribute value combinations in these two different tables. And then once I've got my two different counts for all the different groups, I'm going to compare them based on these two different metrics, right? risk ratio and support. And you can think of risk ratio and support as basically measuring the prevalence of these two different, um, of, the, of the different groups in two different ways, basically. It's kind of telling me, you know what, I only care about things that are 2x more likely, for example, um, in the crash logs, but at least show up 5% of the time. That's kind of the, the intuitive notion of risk ratio and support. Okay? So what I'll get back is I'll get back this table, right? So diff takes in two relations, it outputs a single relation, just like a join would. Okay? And what I've got now is I've got the three columns that I cared about, app version, device type, and OS. And I've got my two uh, metrics, which I'll define in a second, risk ratio and support. And basically, this now is an explanation that's telling me, hey, the combination of this particular app version, this particular device type, and this particular OS is 9.75 times more likely to cause crashes. And it shows up 20% of the time in the crash logs. Right? I've got other explanations, too. Right? These values here that are dashes are just pretty much nulls. Right? So it's saying that this combination is what's causing the problem, as are these two as well. Okay? Now, let's say, okay, I've run this query, I found these results, and you know what? I, I think that third row is really, really interesting. Because the first one, I get it. App version 1 was really old. It's going to cause lots of crashes. And I know that the iPhone X rollout was really, really buggy. So I'm just going to ignore that for now. But this particular combination is pretty alarming, because a lot of my users are using Galaxy S9. So I want to make sure that this is the problem, right? I'm going to use my same interface now, but I'm going to do a time series comparison. I'm going to compare week to week. So I'm going to do again, select from star. Now all I've done is I've swapped out the two relations. I'm using the same operator, but now I'm comparing this week to last week. Okay? I'm going to use the exact same columns to, com to, to uh, compare against, and I'm going to use the same metrics to compare on. And now I get back a single tuple. It's the same combination, but now it says, okay, between this week and last week, the risk ratio increased to 20, right? So now it's 20 times more likely, right? And it showed up 75% of the time. So what's really moving things in the last week is this particular combination. In a sense, it confirmed my original hypothesis from that first query, right? So hopefully these two queries kind of encapsulate for you the power of why this interface is so relevant, right? Because so long as it takes in any two relations, you can compare anything you want, 
right? Now, what we found is actually uh, this operator has a lot of applications and successful use cases in both industry and in academia. So here's just a, a small collection of, of folks that we've worked with um, that have illustrated why it's so powerful. At Google, at Microsoft, at Facebook, we've seen people use it for monitoring different systems, analyzing crashes, trying to track user engagement. Uh, the Census Project actually is another interesting example of this. Uh, Census was a security research project that's now a startup where essentially uh, people have collected internet port scan data all over the world over years and years and years. And what we've done in the Census Project with DIFF is we've been able to do time series analysis and try to explain, hey, for example, you know, these ports were all open a month ago, but now they're all closed. Something is fishy, right? Or these devices were online in India, but now they're offline. That might be something you should check out, right? Um, essentially, what, uh, the reason why we were motivated by this is that one of the professors at Stanford who started the Census Project was responsible for tracking a famous botnet that came up a few years ago called the Mirai botnet. And so he basically challenged us to use Diff to sort of find the Mirai botnet from scratch which took you know, his research team months and months and months to find. So that's why we decided to, to work with them. Um, just to be very precise, I want to make sure I go through all of the elements of the operator so you guys understand exactly what it entails. Um, so here's that first query that I showed you a few slides ago. The two things that you should worry about in, in terms of the relations are the test relation and the control relation. So what we're doing here is we have some test relation that we care about. I care about finding anomalies or explaining anomalies in that test. And I'm going to compare it against some control. Okay. And then I'm going to have a set of dimensions that I care about. And for our intents and purposes, the dimensions are always going to be categorical features. Um, you could use continuous features, but you have to have some way of binning them and, and discretizing them, basically. And then uh, you have your difference metrics, which are telling you, OK, once you do the comparisons on these particular columns or on these particular dimensions, I want to use these particular um, metrics to track the movers to tra and, and sort of populate the folks who are, who are causing um, these particular trends to surface. Right. And each difference metric is associated with a threshold. So in this case, the risk ratio difference metric has a threshold of 2.0, and the support metric has a threshold of 0.05. There's one final optional um, parameter that we have in the diff query, which is sort of the max order of combinations. So what you can say here is you can say, oh, I want to explore only order two combinations or order four combinations, for example. But again, for this talk, we'll just focus on order three, because that tends to be sufficient for most use cases. Okay. I want to focus your attention on the difference metrics because that's actually, I think, where uh, the power of the abstraction really lies. Because what's nice about the difference metric is that once you've defined this interface, you can use this to generalize to other explanation engines. So for example, in Macrobase, we used risk ratio and support. And that's the example that I've shown you so far. But if I wanted to encapsulate data x-ray, all I have to do is rewrite the diagnosis cost that the data x-ray folks came up with as a difference metric, and now I've got the exact same result. And we actually have experimental results that show how this works. Um, if I wanted to you know, capture the semantics of Scorpion, I just redefined the influence metric that they've defined in their paper, and I've also uh, now captured their core semantics as well. Um, if I want to you know, take, take the work of Roy and Sutra from Sigma 2014, I just define the intervention difference metric. And if I want to do just basic frequent item set mining, I just use support. Yeah. Okay, so now let me sort of talk about some of the logical optimizations. Hopefully now I've convinced you that diff is something you know, worth using. Um, so let's say I've got this particular query. Let's say now what I want to do is I want to run my diff query, but before I actually um, take the diff between two different relations, I want to do a natural join with some additional table, right? So for example, I want to augment my crash logs with some user metadata, let's say, to give me a, a broader search space of things that I can search over, right? So what this would look like as a standard query plan, right, is I've got the diff at the top, I've got two joins, and then I've got my four tables at the bottom, right? So the idea that we came up with was, what if we take the diff operator and we push it below the join, right? Which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense at first. But I think the key that you should think about is, instead of doing it on the entire table, what we're only going to do is we're only going to push it on the foreign key column. So what we effectively do here is we have this adaptive algorithm where first we take the diff and we evaluate it on just the foreign key column of crash logs and success logs. And we find essentially a set of candidate keys. Now, if that output is really, really large, we'll just abort and we'll use the standard approach. We'll use this, the, the approach of just taking the joins and then doing the diff after that. But if that, can, if that pool of candidate keys is really small, that effectively prunes our search space quite a bit, right? And so now what we can do is we can take that set of candidate keys, we semi-join them with that user's table, and now we have a set of candidate values, right? And so once we have the set of candidate values, now we can just evaluate the diff a second time on those candidate values, and that gives us our result. 
right? And so later on, I'll show you some experiments where we actually use this to um, accelerate um, one particular query on a pretty large data set from Microsoft. And we also have this synthetic example where we actually I find sort of the ideal sweet spot where you should trade off between the naive approach and this adaptive approach. There's one more additional optimization that I don't have time to talk about right now, but you can also actually use functional dependencies in the data to prune the search space as well. So you don't have to examine all possible combinations. Okay. Now, for the physical optimizations uh, that we came up with, a lot of these are actually pretty standard that you would see in a traditional OLAP engine. Um, so, for example, uh, we dictionary encode you know, these low support values that aren't coming up very frequently. Um, we encode them using bitmaps. I think one thing that's a bit different than most folks when they see this is that we use a cost model to identify when to use bitmaps and when not to. Um, so it's sort of a cardinality-aware case. It turns out that if the cardinality is really high, you shouldn't encode things with bitmaps because then you just have a memory blow up and it just becomes really, really uh, expensive. We also encode things in a linear, in a columnar format so that we can you know, maximize cache locality. And then we use um, an embarrassingly parallel implementation of a priori so we can explore the feature combinations in parallel. Um, this goes against actually most of the, um, the literature and data mining. Most folks re actually recommend they use FP growth because uh, it's supposed to be much faster in the single node case. But a priori is much easier to, to parallelize, so we ended up using that as our implementation. Okay, so actually now to talk about the implementation, um, we have two different implementations of Macrobase. So the first and the single node um, was a fork of the original Macrobase repo. We essentially wrote our own SQL parser um, to support a subset of SQL and, of course, diff. Um, and then we also have a Spark implementation where we actually integrated with the Spark Data Frame API. We can implement our optimizations with the Catalyst optimizer in Spark because it's a rule-based optimization. Um, and then essentially uh, the diff queries are optimized using these Catalyst rules, and then they're translated to some equivalent Spark job using the combination of maps and filters and group buys. Um, there's also a, a kind of a, a cute pruning optimization that we talk about in the paper that reduces the communication costs, um, and it's about 1.6 uh, lines of Java code. Yeah. And it's also open source as well, so I encourage you guys to check out the documentation online and read more about it if you're interested. Okay, on um, the last um, few minutes I have, I'm going to walk you guys through some evaluation results that we have. So here are the five data sets that we used. We took two data sets from the census folks. Um, we also um, were uh, lucky enough to work with the Microsoft teams uh, here in Bellevue and obtain um, two production data sets from them, which was very, very generous of them. And then we also found a public data set from the Center of Medicare um, that um, just basically gave us a lot of data to play with um, and gave us sort of another use case to, 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 to measure uh, the efficacy of DIFF. So um, we benchmarked um, on a single machine using 512 gigs of RAM, uh, and we benchmarked Macrobase SQL against um, these five different engines. And then for each data set, we would execute a diff query and measure the end-to-end -end runtime, and the ingest time was omitted. Um, and whenever possible, we would try our, we'd try our best to sort of mimic um, a query that was being run in production when we benchmarked this stuff. Um, so we would anonymize the tables, for example, and then run things um, as if it was in production. Um, and then for all of the queries that we ran, unless otherwise noted in the paper, we used the risk ratio of, uh, we used the risk ratio in support of difference metrics, and we used a max order of three, and we also used categorical features for our dimensions. So I'll just give a few highlights. Uh, the first one is that when we benchmarked against the oldest version of Macrobase in Postgres, Macrobase SQL um, tended to be much, much faster. So on the left-hand side is just the end-to-end -end runtime and log scale. On the, on the x-axis um, are the five different data sets, and this is for risk ratio and support. Um, the two things that I kind of want to highlight are, well, again, this is in log scale, so, you know, um, you know Macrobase SQL is able to outperform by multiple orders of magnitude um, against Macrobase and, and Postgres. Um, this asterisk here is actually indicating that Postgres wasn't able to explore all order three combinations. It turns out that Postgres limits how many group buys you can do in a single query. So just for the sake of comparison, we limited it to order two, and it was still slower. Um, yeah. We also compared against frequent item set miners. So in this case, we just ran support as our difference metric. And uh, we benchmarked against the SPMF data mining library, both the a priori and the FP growth implementations. Um, and once again, we were faster across all five data sets. Yeah. We also did some experiments where we tried to generalize to other engines, right? So this RS explain is the Roy and Suchu work that I talked about earlier from Sigma 2014. Um, and then we also compared against data x-ray. And here we were pretty much comparable because um, it turns out that for data x-ray, we um, one thing that I didn't mention is that there's another constraint, this minimality constraint about how we return explanations. And in the case of data x-ray, they don't 
actually prefer minimality. They have a different criteria called set coverage. And so there's a set coverage algorithm that you have to run in the case of the detector that actually ends up dominating the runtime. So you know, in this case, you're just, we're pretty much even. Um, but there's no slowdown, effectively. It's a 2% uh, performance hit. Um, looping back to the logical optimizations that we talked about, so in this experiment, what we did is we essentially had a synthetic data set, and we tuned the number of candidate foreign keys in the tables that were generated in these synthetic cases. And so what we were trying to find is, you know, is there a clear crossover point where our adaptive algorithm fails, right? So assuming that we don't have a threshold tuning, you know, can we see when our approach is faster than naive or slower than naive? Turns out that, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that around 5,000 candidate foreign keys is when our adaptive algorithm doesn't work. But when we're actually pruning the candidate foreign keys and then semi-joining, the diff join optimization where we do the predicate pushdown is actually quite effective. And then we also applied this to the MS Telemetry B data set, and we got a 2x improvement in the runtime. Uh, for Spark, we have basically you know, two different data sets that are bigger versions of the previous single node data sets that I talked about. And we benchmarked um, this on the latest version of Spark in a, in a cluster from Google Cloud. And we benchmarked against the Spark ML lib library. Um, so here we ran a scalability um, experiment uh, where we tried to see you know, how well does it scale up as we increase the number of servers. And we're pretty close to ideal. Um, this is on the census data set. And we increased the number of servers to 25. And throughout, we're getting close to linear scale up. And we also have. Um, uh, benchmarks in the paper where we compare against Spark FP growth and Spark uh, a priori. Um, and we also do a factor analysis to show you uh, the importance of each optimization for both the single node and the distributed case. Yeah. And, and finally, we had one more um, experiment that I thought was actually pretty interesting. We ran um, our version of MacroBase SQL and Spark at Facebook on a production cluster using one of their um, production data sets. And this data set you know, is a day's worth of data. It's, it's very, very large. Um, and we were able to sort of you know, answer these questions, answer these queries rather, in you know, you know, about 15 to 20 minutes, which is pretty, pretty good. Because I, the alternative at Facebook was um, using a very, very slow, um, essentially, um, I think it was Presto that they were using that um, would just take you know, hours and hours and hours to run. So we were able to accelerate that quite a bit using Macrobase SQL. Uh, to recap, we introduced this diff operator that captures the core semantics of, of several recent works um, and explanation finding and explanation engines. And ideally, we have this nice singular interface now that can interoperate with traditional OLAP SQL. Um, we also show how we've generalized to these industrial and academic use cases, and we can hopefully um, capture new use cases in the future using diff. Um, and I think what's most exciting is that you know, with these new types of queries that are being run and these new interfaces, hopefully, that we're, we're proposing, does this present even more opportunities for adaptive query optimization, right? What other types of operators can we co-design with diff, for example. And we, we show that we can implement diff in an efficient manner, um, but there's still you know, challenges, I think, in terms of scalability. Because uh, you know, in the case of uh, one of our data sets that had hundreds of columns, it was still very expensive to explore all of these possible feature combinations. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done in implementing um, faster and more efficient versions of that as well. Um, especially, I think, in the realm of approximation or approximate query processing, there's a lot of interesting things that we can do. Um, I again want to thank our collaborators one last time from Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. Um, I also encourage you guys to check out the, uh, the Macrobase website if you want to learn more. Uh, but at this time, I'm happy to take questions.